We will now begin our first panel discussion of the day in which panelists who are the leading co-chairs of the 11 task forces will be summarizing the key themes from yesterday's task force breakout sessions. Please allow me to welcome the chair of the session, Mr. Turki Shweir, the Deputy Director General of the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies, as well as the Deputy Sherpa of T20 Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Saleh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to the third and final day of what has been an exciting event. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome all co-chairs who have been tremendously helpful during these past couples of months and absolute joy to work with. I would like to, work, I would like to introduce each one of the late co-chair. So I will start with Dr. Sayyid Sheikh, Lord, lead co-chair for Task Force Trade, Investment and Growth. Dr. Noura Mansouri, lead co-chair for task, for task Force Climate Change and Environment. Dr. Raja Marzoghi, lead co-chair for Task Force Infrastructure Investment and Financing. Dr. Suzanne Al-Qurashi, lead co-chair for Social Cohesion and the State. Dr. Abdelaziz Ben Sagar, lead co-chair for Task Force the Future Multilism and the Global Governance. Dr. Heidi Al-Askari, lead co-chair for Task Force Economy, Employment and Education in Digital Age. Dr. Walid al attas Task Force Advisor for G20 Support for SDGs and Development Cooperation. Mr. Nabil Mbarak, lead, lead co-chair for Task Force International Financial Architecture. Her Royal Highnesses, Dr. Maha bint Mshari Al-Saud, lead co-chair for Task Force Migration and Young Society. Dr. Hassa al tayri lead co-chair for Task Force Sustainability Energy, Water and Food System. Dr. Yasin Arabi, lead co-chair for Task Force COVID-19, multidisciplinary approaches to complex problems. The main purpose of our panel discussion today is to shed light on the key themes that we had discussed yesterday and to think together about what way forward looks like. It seems that most suitable way to do it is to go by order. So we will start with task force number one and work out way up to task force 11. Each one of the panelists will take maximum of five minutes to talk and I will remind each of you before the time is in. We will begin the discussion with the question of each, uh, each co-chair and you are also welcome during the, uh, the five minute slot to speak about the main policy brief with the new task force. So task force number one, trade, investment and growth, led by Dr. Sayyid Sheikh. My question to you, Doctor, how, to, how, to, how the current uh, global situation influenced, changed or enhanced the policy recommendation with the new task force? Please, the, the floor is yours, Doctor. Please unmute your, uh, you are muted. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Turkey. Good afternoon to uh, all participants to this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you again. Uh, just before uh, answering your question, let me first update you on the key themes and policy recommendations that you discussed during the breakout uh, session of the task force one, investment, trade, and growth. Uh, the discussion centered on four themes, uh, trade reform, subsidies and tax, digital technologies and investment, and fourth, the diversifications. Also on a logistic matter, these, these themes were covered in nine policy briefs and all of them are currently at the stage of draft submittal. And I feel very confident that all will be meeting the deadline for final submittal. Uh, back to your question. Uh, first of all, thanks to T20 Secretariat for advising us to address the coronavirus early on. Uh, so that issue uh, had been, or this advice had helped us to set the direction. Um, some of the policy briefs already tackled the challenges of COVID-19 pandemic. It was understood 
that the pandemic presented another challenge on top of the already existing challenges facing the world trading system, which arise from protectionism, unequal opportunities to access the global value chains, besides legal issues related to digital trade and trade and services. Briefly, I'll share with you a few thoughts on how the current pandemic influence policy briefs under this task force. First, there was a clear message that the WTO reform is doable despite the many challenges that undermines its existence now. The task force one believes that the pandemic demonstrated that the multilateral trading system is needed more than ever in order to minimize disruptions of the necessary means to meet upcoming health and economic challenges. To that end, it was recommended in one of the policy briefs that G20 should start a dialogue at the multilateral level in order to reform WTO and its functions. Also still in WTO space, particularly regarding the industrial subsidy, it is noted in one of the policy brief that in the absence of multilateral agreements, it is recommended to explore a plurilateral path, but in a broader rather than member targeted reform to tackle the subsidies thorny issue currently under WTO. As related to WTO, since plurilateral agreements are becoming a central area in the sort of trade debate, which can be regarded as an alternative negotiation method to curb the inflexibility and reaching consensus, it is recommended in another policy brief that establishing core principles and procedures to govern such plurilateral agreements are highly needed. Regarding also the pandemic, it is discussed by task force members that a rebound of economic activity is surely doable. And while fiscal policy stimulations and monetary policy recommendations, which G20 governments and central banks of these countries have acted to support their economies, it is important not to ignore the role of fair trade policy and stimulating a global economic growth. And this has been addressed in some of the policy briefs and its recommendation and their recommendations. Also, it was emphasized through the discussion to keep international markets open and predictable, as well as to foster a more favorable business environment, especially for sustainable foreign investment. In order to lessen the impact of the pandemic, and here particularly on primary material related based economies, those in developing countries. In this context, it has been recommended in the diversification policy briefs that G20 should assist in broadening of the export base through global value chain, which can help in maintaining stability and export receipts and generating long-term economic growth in these countries. Last also, minute. Uh, just a f just one, one and a half minute. It was warned that a turn towards protectionism, which took place by some countries during the early month of the pandemic, would introduce other adverse implications on top of the challenges that developing countries are currently experiencing. The last point, the current pandemic necessitated, as we know, social distancing around the world, which opened the door for a much wider use of a range of digital technologies and cross-border services. This has received great attention from the task force, and it has been recommended in some policy briefs that G20 has the opportunity 
to assume leadership by implementing best practice policy and by creating in interoperable regulatory settings in order for the economies to reap the productivity benefits of the digital technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sayed, for an enlightening presentation. And I'm sure that through this discussion, you have to foster a common understanding of global issues. Thank you very much again. Thank All you. right, now we'll move to the second task force, which is climate change and environment, led by Dr. Noura Mansouri. Dr. Noura, the current crisis brought about greater awareness about climate change and environmental issues. Do you see that reflected in the policy briefs and the policy recommendations within your task force? And you may also mention them in recommendation with, with your task force. Thank you very much. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you virtually. We had a very productive session yesterday. 80 participants from the task force uh, have uh, showed up and we were busy discussing and uh, debating the policy briefs uh, 26 of them uh, being drafted by 181 uh, authors from across the globe, 28 countries to be, uh, to be precise. Uh, we also discussed the impact of COVID-19, as you uh, men men mentioned, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and how they affect uh, the key recommendations. Um, coronavirus, of course, and climate are two converging global crises. Uh, COVID-19 has distracted governments all over the world, and uh, this unfortunately may impact the two landmark uh, agreements on climate, the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goal number 13 on climate action. Uh, fighting these global threats necessitate effective multilateralism through international coordination and cooperation, as well as laying the foundation for a strong economic recovery, one that offers a balanced, sustainable, and comprehensive growth. Biodiversity, the, the variety of life on Earth, is the foundation of life and sustainable development. Through pollution and megatrends such as climate change and uh, uh, rapid population, as well as anthropogenic environmental uh, pressures, accentuates the problem. So destroyed habitats may create the perfect conditions for pandemic such as COVID-19 to emerge. And ironically, tackling climate change and uh, the implementation of international agreements, as well as the new uh, global uh, biodiversity goals post 2020 may also now be delayed or compromised altogether. As you may know, COVID-19 has canceled so many international events including Cl Climate COP26, as well as Biodiversity COP15. Hence, the G20 must fill the gap in effective multilateralism. The G20, of course, has long addressed the climate change and environment problem, and the G20 Saudi presidency has nature in its agenda of safeguarding the planet, as well as in its goals of managing emissions for sustainable development as well as combating land degradation and habitat loss. This provides the perfect and supportive synergies. The G20 has the opportunity to really lead the international community in working toward minimizing land degradation, deforestation, and conserve biodiversity and meet the climate targets. But as you know, the G20 countries uh, are, uh, include the world's largest producers and consumers of fossil fuels. The G20's country's energy supply is still dependent 82% on fossil fuels. So how the G20 countries uh, uh, prevent carbon produced from fossil fuels to accumulate in the atmosphere will eventually determine whether the world stays below the Paris Agreement's warming threshold. The G20 Saudi presidency is proposing the circular carbon economy which offers a new way of approaching climate targets and implicitly values all the options and encourages all the efforts for carbon accumulation, uh, for, for, for target for mitigating carbon accumulation in the atmosphere. Achieving the Paris Agreement of, target of, of limiting the rise 
of uh, global temperature rise to two degrees Celsius pre-industrial level, let alone its aspirational targets of limiting that rise to 1.5, necessitate the uh, inclusion of all energy options, especially with minimum stranded assets and an orderly energy transition, such as expanding the use of renewable energy, supporting nuclear energy, and ensuring the participation of the hard to abate industries, the last mile of decarbonization. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to a global economic paralysis, putting nearly half the global workforce at risk, disrupting energy markets, economies, and societies. Tackling climate change will now prove more challenging as governments take on massive debts to cushion their countries from the immediate impacts of the pandemic and lockdown measures and recover economically. Large-scale investments in abatement technologies such as energy efficiency in buildings, in industries, hydrogen, carbon capture utilization and storage now need to, to be included in plans to re-energize the economy. We must see the COVID-19 crisis as a lesson in how to address climate change quickly and cooperatively. Coordinated G20 efforts are vital in pursuing this goal. Post-pandemic economic recovery stimulus packages, especially fossil fuel bailouts, must be built around a circular carbon economy framework to simultaneously address social and environmental concerns while stimulating economic prosperity for a more comprehensive, inclusive, and sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noura, for the, an excellent presentation. We'll move now to the task force, infrastructure, investment, and financing, led by Dr. Rajal Marzoghi. Before this current global situation, public and private investment and infrastructure were needed to meet the increasing demand for infrastructure globally and to reduce the, the infrastructure gap between advanced and emerging economies. Dr. Raja, how did you see the pandemic affected the policy recommendation within your task force? Please, the floor is yours. Dr. Raja? I'm sorry, it was mute. It's okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon everyone. Uh, Turkey, uh, as you know, we, uh, we felt what we already proposed before and emphasized on, it's become really more relevant and important for several reasons. The first reason, debt to GDP in government, in most of governments, developed and developing country increased on average, hundred, and might pass it even for uh, a lot of them. On developing countries, we know it's, it's now more than 50 on average percent of the GDP. This is first. Second, growth declined. Uh, the average now growth for global economy has been estimated lately by IMF and World Bank is around maybe minus seven. The third issue, the, the, after the COVID-19, as His Excellency Dr. Fahad Mubarak mentioned, the lack of adequate health care, maybe globally and in several countries, which had a negative impact on the growth. Therefore, we thought such kind of encouraging more private sector to, uh, to participate in financing infrastructure is really important uh, as you know, there is two angles where, uh, where infrastructures help the economy and have this positive impact on, uh, on uh, two atoms, but it's the debt and the growth. First of all, it's, it's impact on, on the GDP formations. The second, the direct impact and, uh, and, uh, uh, on it, in each sectors. So this impact has a positive on the growth of the GDP. Uh, as you know, infrastructures, uh, when we divide them, some of the literature considers two types, the social infrastructures, which is including health and education and economics infrastructures. So if you, if you focus on the social one, we know that in most, in some, in several countries, specifically in developing countries, 
the quality of health care is much below what may maintain the minimum requirement of health to, uh, to, to, to maintain the health of people. So injecting more capital, and that was actually one of the debate yesterday in our panel, where some of participants on the, on the, on the webinar suggesting a global fund to finance and help such kind uh, of, of uh, an adequate uh, infrastructure in some of the uh, developing countries, uh, which will uh, have its own positive impact at the end in the global economy. So the relation in this case make it really more relevant. The problem which most of the public investment, uh, the, the infrastructure investment faced, uh, is specifically in some of the developing countries, as when we discussed in our, uh, in, in our task force, lack of, uh, of transparency in uh, several countries. The second issue with the corruption in, uh, and also with several countries. The third, lack of uh, accountability, uh, lack of available or maybe uh, affordable and uh, accurate data that will help private sector. As you know, at the end, the private sector will calculate the injections of their investment according to rate of return and risk they faced. So with, with these issues in hand, then the risk on private sector increased. And this is will lower the quantity of money that they can inject uh, to participate in, in, invest, in, in financing uh, infrastructures. So with, the, with a high debt to GDP, with the situation where most countries now are on globally, it's become difficult for, for countries to put more money on infrastructures. So this is, will, uh, will, will, uh, will, will, uh, will lead to lack of supply compared to demand and increase the gap. So the increase the gap will have its negative impact in the growth, then will be in a, negative, in a, in a lower growth than, 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 than should be, and also will increase the efficiency in most of this economy. Hence, uh, solving these issues, and that's what's also been discussed in the panel uh, and the webinar yesterday, and it's one of our recommendations, how the G20, with the strength of its member, will be able to put some uh, more pressure in most of countries in our globe to improve the accountability, to reduce the corruption, to increase the, tra increase the transparency and the availability of data. This need may be a new platform in the G20, as His Excellency Dr. Fahd al-Barak mentions, after, after the, after the crisis 2008, we've been able to develop good financial sectors, including banking, which saved us for uh, the last uh, few years after the 2008. Now with the COVID-19, I think we need to focus more in health and also in improving the environment to have more fund from private sector to join the public fund and help more to uh, increase the quality and also the supply of infrastructures to match the demand needed and has its more uh, impact on the growth and uh, release the stress uh, on government not to inject more money uh, as they have more debt and increasing the debt to GDP will have a negative impact on them and they will not be able to do it. So this need may be a, a big step from G pressure, specifically on the transparency, reducing the corruption, the uh, accountability in most of the developing country and the availability of data. All of us on the, on the task force, as we uh, review the literatures and have some connections with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of, uh, of platforms and regional institutions and global institutions, there are a lot of private funds available to, to participate in. But the problem, the obstacles they face, as I mentioned, uh, prevent them and make the risk higher, which uh, encourage them, or at least they require higher rate of return to be able to uh, participate in. Without higher rate of return, they will not be able to participate. So this is, will increase the cost of the society, will have negative impact on the, risk and, uh, on the total welfare in each country and on our globe. So solving this one will reduce the risk, will make the rate of return acceptable for them, and this is, will, will save a lot of resources and maximizing the Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Raja. And I hope that will help really to solve the barriers and promote the opportunities uh, for, for improving the public and private infrastructure investment. Thank you again. We'll move now to task force four. Social Did you get your work question? Hello? Social yes. Social cohesion and agility, let me introduce you, Dr. Uh, Suzanne. Social cohesion and the state led by Dr. Suzanne al -Qurashi. This is a time uh, where cooperation is of uh, utmost importance. Uh, could you tell us, Dr. Uh, Suzanne, uh, about uh, how civil society initiatives are proving to be as important as the government-led efforts worldwide? And also, you may mention the main recommendation uh, was discussing yesterday with your task force. OK, OK. Thank you so much, Turkey. And uh, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, well, I'm happy, uh, very happy to see you all here. And I would begin just uh, briefly to thank my co-chairs, uh, for their effort and uh, contribution, and my TF uh, uh, coordinator, Hanina Sides, for her support and help. Uh, definitely, your question and answer, it will be reflect the recommendations in the task force policy briefs. If you allow me to present what we did yesterday, and it will, it will come the answer between the recommendations uh, and yesterday breakout sessions. So, uh, well, just briefly, we have received 40 uh, policy brief and uh, we accept 11 abstract, it all uh, uh, developed uh, into policy brief, which were presented yesterday in our breakout session. And definitely the policy brief have been designed to address social cohesion and the state uh, from varying perspective to ensure effectiveness of the recommendation made. Uh, the, as uh, my colleague uh, in, first in uh, task force uh, one, uh, we, we uh, put uh, for success for uh, TF4 uh, policy brief recommendation, uh, we uh, put it in a theme, four, uh, four themes. Uh, one is, uh, first one is um, uh, a global uh, social cohesion, national social cohesion and social measurement and uh, finally, the COVID-19, we have two policy brief concentrate the link between social cohesion and how reflect on uh, society and social cohesion, and also how reflect on uh, the, uh, the relationship between society and governments. So um, I'll just, I'll give you a short brief. I wouldn't take to, uh, too much time in each uh, national uh, social, for example, uh, the point we, uh, we uh, tackle uh, yesterday, uh, three in the national social cohesion, gender gap and leadership, and also the author, she emphasized on how reflect this situation on the female leaders in terms of, of, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, especially when leaders um, uh, away from their, uh, from their team and the, how they can how they can manage it, and they are overcome over their world. And well, uh, one of uh, the co-chairs, uh, 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 he mentioned good point that uh, global leaders, me, uh, female, uh, just uh, shows in a good, uh, good uh, uh, exercise on how, like New Zealand, like uh, the the prime minister in New Zealand, they just finished last week from first uh, patient in COVID-19 hailing from the COVID-19. Uh, we also tackle economic inequality, but we put impact on COVID-19, for example, on SMEs, small business, which affect, uh, as um, uh, Dr. Mubarak said, that uh, affect the small business heavily and leave many people with unemployment. Uh, we tackle uh, the smart decentralization, and uh, one of the, uh, the good policy brief also, improving life expectancy, uh, especially in this current uh, uh, crisis, has devastated the health system and restructuring what, what, the, what the recommendation uh, uh, recommend, restructuring the health system in needed, is needed to ensure higher life expectancy. Uh, we, move, we move to the global social cohesion and the authors also, women in a global chain, 
uh, improving early childhood, all these recommendations, they emphasize on how it will be and the impact of COVID-19 on, I mean, the, the uh, how it is, it will be include the post, uh, po, uh, the uh, provision, provision for post-civil uh, COVID-19 uh, world. Um, uh, global basic income, this is for the global uh, policy brief, uh, uh, how affect the global uh, basic in, uh, income and TF uh, recommendation, establishing a basic global income for all and implementing uh, uh, progress, uh, progressive tax uh, reform. Social measurement also, all our recommendations, the 11, emphasize on how these policy brief, regardless, it's written at the beginning without this crisis, but all the policy brief move on to uh, how it affects affect the whole world and especially the society and the cohesion of the society and the, um, uh, the uh, relation with the, between society and, uh, and states. Uh, the last good um, two, um, uh, two policy brief on COVID-19, uh, one is presenting the governing di diagnostic, the situation of comply uh, compliance with the G20 uh, nations to coordinate efforts uh, Again, uh, again, uh, against the pandemic. Uh, the last one is assessing the well-being impact on the COVID-19 pandemic on three, poli three uh, policy types, uh, uh, suppressions, control and uncontrol and spread. So as you see, this is the answer of your questions. And I can add from our uh, Saudi society, some initiatives, uh, comes from the government, like Kulana Mas'ul, and some comes from the society, like Ahil uh, the volunteer, especially the young, the young, uh, the young society, uh, they, they, they have like uh, 100 and 700 on waiting list to be involved. These uh, small uh, groups, they, what they do, they, they deliver the uh, grocery and medicine to society free, free of charge, which is excellent. This, this is one of, uh, and globally, globally, as we can see from the celebrities and, 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 and. <laughs> sorry, maybe I take more than five minutes, but it's uh, a huge topic and um, we really, it, it, it touch the social cohesion. It's really touch in these circumstances. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Suzanne, for your pres uh, presentation. And certainly, uh, this will help to understand the role of cultural capital and the social inclusion of migrants and creating prosperous uh, society. Thank you again, Dr. Suzanne. Task force number five, the future of multilateralism and the global governance, led by Dr. Abdelaziz bin Sagar. Dr. Abdelaziz, this virus knows no geographical boundaries. The, cu the current pandemic sheds light on how we need, how we need multilateralism now more than ever. When you when you uh, when in your opinion is it more, is it important to work collectively? Can you talk please uh, to us about the policy recommendations that introduce uh, collect uh, collective action within your task force? <laughs> آه شكرا لصاحب السمو الملكي الامير تركي الفيصل حفظه الله آه معالي الدكتور الصديق العزيز الدكتور فهد المبارك والاخ العزيز الدكتور فهد التركي شكرا لكم جميعا على تنظيم هذا اللقاء. آه yes indeed the pandemic was a powerful reminder of how badly we need multilateralism institution uh, to mitigate global crisis, coordinate the supply of personnel uh, protective equipment, PPE, and sharing best practice for policies uh, response were important element for implementing policies response to take the uh, pandemic. Uh, thus, we out uh, to recognize the robust multilateral institution and cooperation are the core of any uh, productive solution to a global uh, public policies challenges, climate challenges, 
uh, all uh, uh, all uh, uh, AI economic uh, crisis uh, following the pandemic, etc., uh, links to G2, G20 and the WHO. At the same time, the pandemic and the required policy uh, response, such as closing uh, border, uh, interrupting trade and travel, uh, threatening the globalized uh, foundation of political and economic uh, multilateralism, multilateralism institution. Uh, during our meeting yesterday, uh, several of our task force members discussed how COVID-19 specifically affecting uh, the policy recommendation and multilateralism as um, a whole. For example, one of the paper uh, discussed the armed forces uh, that all of a sudden need to fulfill a civilian task such as building hospital, providing an aid, uh, which is not out of their uh, necessarily trained uh, form. They were not trained for that. Um, also uh, uh, discouraging civilian or parliamentarian ability to control the armed forces uh, poses significant uh, regulatory problems. Another paper discussed how the crisis uh, of the pandemic uh, may also hold a chance uh, for us uh, to improve the follow of the, uh, uh, the uh, previously existing system. For example, uh, one of the researchers linked uh, the economic and environment uh, issues uh, in the uh, uh, context of the G20 and the chances to facilitate uh, green growth. Uh, another researcher uh, discussed also uh, a policy recommendation to establish a G20 working group um, on the future of multilateralism is crucial moving forward. Uh, the uh, contact mandate for this uh, working group would be designed and achieved uh, consequences on the traffic rules needed to achieve um, adequate multilateral cooperation and coordination while ensuring that the multilateralism system remain democratically legitimate, legitimate and uh, politically sustainable in order for the G20 to truly promote multilateralism and collective action. Uh, the need uh, to be a specific G20 working group uh, uh, detected to multi dedicated to multilateralism and global governance. Uh, we need to uh, understand that uh, thinking about the crisis is not a domestic exercise. In fact, we have a great deal of influence um, how post-COVID-19 world will look like. Uh, it is an opportunity to build the groundwork for a future economic growth, the work for um, everyone by uh, crafting uh, prudent and ambition policy recommendation for the G20. Well, I try to squeeze it on the time that you have allocated for us, so not to exceed it that uh, since we have a very limited time, Turkey. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdelaziz, for an enlightening speech. Uh, so uh, I will move now to another task force, which is economy, employment, and education, and the digital age, led by Dr. Heidi Laskari. Dr. Heidi, the current pandemic halted traditional education practice. What lesson can be learned from this and will it lead to the fundamental change in the way education is carried out in the long, in the long run? Um, good afternoon, everyone, your Royal Highnesses, your Excellencies, uh, my esteemed colleagues uh, and lead co-chairs, and hello to everyone in the network and the T20 network. I would like to start, first of all, by thanking everyone who's contributed to Task Force 6. Uh, from our administrative support, our teams at CAPSARC and KF Chris, 
um, as well as our extended networks through the Task Force 6 um, network. Um, again, my co-chairs uh, and my authors uh, and the whole network who's actually been extremely supportive and interactive with us. Task Force 6 has a great um, obligation and responsibility to cover a multitude of topics um, that, uh, that in, in essence, when you look at them from, from a bird's eye view, seem somewhat uh, siloed and unrelated. But when you take it under a subject like education, um, you start to see where a lot of these connections are made, particularly when you have a cross-cutting theme of uh, digitization being the topic. Uh, our task force had four key areas that we, as topical areas that we covered. Uh, we broadly bucketed them into artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, uh, education, and uh, the economy and employment. And like I said, that really had the, the cross-cutting theme of, of the impact of digitization in these areas. Um, so thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Schwerer, and I, and I want to just give you some highlights. The topic of education, particularly in this context, uh, to be covered in, in three to five minutes, um, I feel the weight of responsibility to do it justice. Uh, but uh, I would like to highlight some of the uh, excellent policy briefs that we had. We have had over the past few months several interesting discussions that have actually grown in terms of importance um, because of COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 has really demonstrated the importance of building resilience uh, to face the various threats that we've seen from the pandemic disease to extremist violence to climate insecurity, and particularly the rapid technological change and knowledge change that we've seen throughout the pandemic. When it comes to the issue of education, I think every parent listening today and every parent in our community uh, will be the first to say that, you know, moving to a digital platform has had immense uh, impact in terms of education and the challenges that we've seen. Um, uh, we have several policy briefs that looked at some of these issues as standalone issues, but I would like to summarize our key uh, topical areas across the policy briefs that I think when taken together, highlight several important and extremely critical issues um, that we need to highlight when it comes to education, and in particular, when we start to move forward uh, in the educational domain. Uh, the first one would be uh, the idea of universal accessibility and accessibility for all. So while many of our policy briefs looked at including, um, you know, equity in terms of gender balance, uh, equity in terms of access uh, to services. If we're on a digital platform, we need to make sure that these platforms are accessible for all, whether it's actually being able to get to the technology. We know today that some children have full accessibility and they're on platforms like Zoom and it's very interactive, where the, whereas in other regions in the world, uh, they only may have access to getting their lesson plans on WhatsApp if at that, they may have to go without being educated on a digital platform. So do they actually have access to the platforms that are needed to educate them in a digital world? Secondly, once they're on that, is there universal access? Do we have access for everyone, persons with disabilities, um, marginalized groups, gender equity, et cetera? Um, the second major topic that uh, has come up and, and certainly has gained uh, importance as we've gone along and, and we were very fortunate from the, the very start of our work uh, to have several policy briefs uh, presented in this domain is the idea of um, or, or the topic of child safety and the governance of child safety online. Uh, it's very clear to us that there are a lot of child protection policies uh, out there um, and, and certainly a, a lot of rights-based conventions out there that protect the rights of children. However, once we get on the digital platforms, there's multiple layers where we haven't even begun to explore how our children and our communities stay safe. So we discuss things like, um, you know, is it a safe world out there? How do we govern that? How do we raise awareness? Are we sure that everybody has access to the issues out there? Is it available in a multitude of languages? Are there governing bodies that will actually put the laws that will govern 
who is radicalizing our children, who are threatening our children, who are leading them even to things like suicidal ideations. These are extremely important issues and they come up within the educational domain, particularly in the digital world, because they're embedded in ways that it's very hard to police and very hard to enforce uh, laws around it at this point if they exist in, in, a, in a structured way. The second area in terms of digital autonomy, um, safety and security is our data. Um, this came up uh, in a couple of uh, our policy briefs as well. Um, well, we have a we understand when we work on a one to one basis, we know who we're dealing with. We know who when we're doing face to face interactions and we go to entities, we understand that we may have a contract with that person in front of us to uh, protect our confidentiality and be able uh, to protect autonomy moving forward. The question will be in a cyber in cyberspace with third parties being involved. Do we actually know who's getting our data? Do we know who's getting the data of our children through our educational platforms and what they're gonna be doing with that? So in terms of safety, autonomy, and security, um, this is a high priority for, for us. In terms of, you know, like I said, what, one of our topical areas is the economy and employment. And again, uh, COVID-19 has completely blasted open what skills are needed with huge populations of individuals moving to unemployment. Education is no longer restricted for K to 12 or K to university. We're not only talking about higher education in terms of formalized education. We are now looking at a potential generation, uh, maybe even a newer generation, COVID-19 generation, of people who've actually finished their education but now have to begin a whole new for, uh, formal way of learning and different ways of lifelong learning. So there's multiple policy briefs that look at various skills that will be required, whether it's FinTech, how do we measure competencies in terms of education? How do we measure these competencies in terms of how they relate to the jobs that are gonna be needed in the future? And we have several of the policy briefs that have come up with uh, very robust and interesting disaggregated measures that exist out there, but they've never been connected. So one of the things that we, we really will, will work on in terms of our communicating, in terms of our final recommendations, will be how do we take these multiple policy briefs and build them into 360 comprehensive governance models that can be taken into consideration when taken as a collective, will have immense impact on a sector that has been known and has a reputation for being very slow in development. And now they're really forced to be very progressive, very quick and very agile uh, in order to not lose a whole generation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heidi, for an, uh, an excellent presentation. And I'm confident through this discussion and uh, policy briefs uh, will provide a concrete and sustainable policy measures that maintain individuality, respect confidentiality, and encourage inclusion in the digital age. Thank you again, Dr. Heidi. We'll move now to Task Force 7, G20, Support for SDGs and Development Cooperation, led by Dr. Sami Swalem. Uh, Dr. Sami cannot be with us today, uh, and Dr. Walid Attas, Task Force Advisor, will be following and, uh, for Dr. Sami today and re uh, representing this task force. Dr. Walid, this task force focuses on developing policies uh, that will uh, that will seek to uh, incentivize private sector support for SDGs. Could you please take us through you through the main recommendations that you reached so far? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Your Royal Highness, uh, Capsark and King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies, for this opportunity. Our task force, uh, as everybody is aware, supports the Sustainable Development Goals and Development Cooperation. Uh, we met again yesterday, during which time we received 58 relevant uh, policy briefs that were uh, reviewed, and uh, final 11 of them uh, policy briefs were selected and presented and thoroughly uh, discussed. Uh, these policy briefs focused on uh, the importance of education, uh, health, science and technology, and the role of innovation and non-state actors in modern day development cooperation. 
Uh, allow me uh, to summarize the main points that were discussed as follows. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the fore the critical issue of financing the SDGs uh, that we need to reinforce and renew our commitment with urgent focus. Just to give an example, before COVID-19, the, the world needed an equivalent of uh, one Aramco per annum in order to finance the SDGs on an annual basis until 2030. However, today, we don't know how many equivalent of Aramcos uh, are, is required in order to finance the uh, sustainable development goals on annual basis. That gives us the nature and significance of the financing gap that the world is facing to, uh, to maintain the same momentum. Uh, the financing gap, as I mentioned, looks even more challenging as a result of the impact of COVID-19 on world economies with reallocation and reprioritization of already scarce resources towards tackling the immediate health and economic and monetary uh, problems. Incentivizing the private sector to commit financially in a weakened economic climate will even be another major challenge as many countries have a tight fiscal space and debt exposure, making it even more difficult to provide incentives through subsidies or taxation to the private sector for the achievement of the SDGs. In a nutshell, Mr. Chairman, COVID-19 has impacted the implementation of the SDGs, representing a potential loss of several years of implementation progress already uh, that we were behind target. So in a post-2030 agenda, global 2030 agenda, uh, the task force calls for a more realistic debate that could take place and it, we insist, we insist upon the international arena for the creation of a maximal, in, maximal enabling environment for the treatment of global public goods. We cannot afford in any future international debate to agree on something without making sure that the financial commitment, commitments by everybody is also on the table. Finally, G20 today faces a twin challenge of accelerating the action on SDGs and also addressing the COVID-19 crisis. For this, there has to be a revision in the political agenda in light of the COVID-19 challenges. This will mean a greater focus on ensuring that technology and innovation minimize the digital divide to help governments and the private sector and the philanthrop uh, philanthropists and NGOs to ensure greater and speedier human development, sustainability, and inclusiveness and prosperity. A focus on early child education, universal health coverage, and its impact on improving the status of the families and future livelihoods has been a key out outcome of this uh, task force, Mr. Chairman. Another uh, has been the impact of ensuring financing through philanthropic support, which enables increased funding of the SDGs at the time of tightening, tightening fiscal space with greater linkages among the working groups to be more effective in a G20 efficacy as a unique global process. The challenges facing humans are much more critical and hence needs to be addressed using a much more integrated multilateral system to enable even faster response to this crisis and future crises, uh, God forbid. A global challenge calls for a global solution. There is no escape from this universal principle. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you, Dr. Walid, for being with us today. Uh, and thank you also for the great presentation. Your task force International Financial uh, Architecture, led by the Mr. Nabil al Mbarak. Mr. Nabil, in light of the COVID-19 crisis, how can the G20 support low-income countries? And more proudly, more proudly, how will this crisis change the international financial architecture, both in the short and the long run? And also, you may, uh, you may mention the uh, main recommendations that in, in, policy, in your policy, please. Please, the floor is yours. Highness uh, Prince Turkey and Faisal and uh, Your Excellency Dr. Fadl Mubarak and 
my friend Dr. Fahad Turki and uh, my uh, also colleagues as the lead co-chairs. Uh, I'm very proud to be with you on this uh, very special uh, panelist, and I think it's, uh, it's an added value to me more than I can contribute to this, but uh, what we've done in, uh, in our uh, task force, first of all, let me say you know, COVID-19 as a pandemic, uh, even though it's un unfortunate, and uh, it was a serious damage uh, in the health side, uh, more than 8 million uh, cases, almost half a million deaths, unfortunately. And uh, now people talk about uh, the second wave, we hope not uh, the case. Um, for, fortunately for us as a task force, you know, most of the selective uh, policies that we were uh, wanted through even before the pandemic was uh, somehow uh, uh, become like very important to what we are doing, even though uh, we try to shift it to comply with the COVID-19 cases. So, um, and one of the things that we find out, which is a uh, look bizarre, but uh, this is the fact that most of the developed countries, um, they have more cases than uh, developing countries, which is mean that the, the health systems and uh, the society is more developed to have uh, discovered those cases where the developing country, they don't have those to uh, tools to basically find out who's infected with this uh, pandemic. So what we thought, you know, the uh, task force aid, which is the fin international financial uh, architect, already uh, in a disrupted phases, uh, even before the pandemic, which is basically a lot of things happening that changing the whole uh, financial industry worldwide. As an example, uh, digital uh, currency, digital money, uh, the fintech challenge that we have, the coordination for the monetary policy and physical monetary, the all challenges already happening before the pandemic. With having this pandemic uh, for COVID-19, it's become more important that those issues need to be covered as soon as possible and try to find out in a global level with a very clear coordination to help a global uh, financial industry. One of the things that we had uh, as a one policy, which is basically was covered, um, how to support uh, healthy uh, and low income countries, which is I think was one of the first decision being done by the G20 leaders under the presidency of Saudi Arabia leadership uh, of uh, the Holy Mosque, uh, King Salman, was to support the low income countries and waive some of the uh, obligation they will have at least until the pandemic over which is a proof that the policy was very important. And we think you know, this is one of the most, uh, most important policy that we are basically working on it. And I hope it will be reached to the uh, leader level to uh, think about it. The second one, which is also we uh, become uh, with the COVID-19 issue, a very important topic to the G20 and non-G20 also, which is we call it the global financial safety net. I think this has also become very clear because even the developed country, the big countries uh, uh, was having uh, some problems in financing and dealing with this pandemic uh, during the shutdown of their economy. This is also considered as one of the main and important policy that we also uh, work on it and hopefully it will help. Um, the second of this is uh, the monetary policies uh, strategy uh, during the COVID-19 and even after COVID-19 need to be considered to look differently because as we said, the COVID changed a lot of things, but also with the other factor that already revolving for the last few years, uh, taking consideration the big tech that entering the finance, uh, the digital money, the stable coin, those issue is become like a very serious pressure that facing the monetary policy in specific, but other policy like physical policy, uh, policy and economic policy because the country are not ready to deal with those challenges, uh, even without COVID-19 will face a problem to be able to cope with uh, the wallet trend that we are seeing worldwide. And last but not least is basically, two important one is basically uh, the cybersecurity issue. And we have a very good paper, a very light one, but we think also it would help uh, to deal with this uh, cyber issues uh, what, we, what they call it, the author call it cyber awareness citizenship, which is here they are trying to give a holistic view on literacy to the digital age. And I think uh, as mentioned some of my colleague about education, digital education and other issues that caused by COVID-19, 
it shows that we have a very important uh, task we need to deal with it, which is the cybersecurity. If we're going to continue dealing with those technology uh, because of the COVID-19, even after COVID-19, we will still continue doing this. This is overall the number of policies that we uh, decide to deal with it. And this task force was nine policies, and we try to be very limited, but very proud policies that will be uh, helping, hopefully, uh, to come up with a very important uh, recommendation uh, to the G uh, G20 level. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tur Thank you, Mr. Nabil, for the great explanation. Task Force Migration and Young Society, led by Her Royal Highness Dr. Maha bint Mshari al Saud. Your Royal Highness, during global crisis of such magnitude, migrants and young societies face greater challenges. Is it possible to mitigate short and long term consequences of the pandemic on migrants and young communities? And of course, you may, you may mention the main recommendations that were discussed yesterday through the webinar. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salat wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellencies, esteemed uh, chairs, co-chairs of the uh, task force of T20, uh, with a global challenge like none of us have experienced before, Saudi Arabia steps up and it leads with heart, vision and grace. Using a virtual platform, and with the help of the dedicated, professional, trailblazing members of this community, it engages all G20 leaders. Amidst plummeting oil prices, stopped economies, and as the earth holds its breath still, and humanity retreats behind closed doors and borders, privacy was exchanged for security, and the world confronts failed multilateralism and the rise in nationalism. And we are planning for an unknown future. It's with pride that I stand here and the privilege of being a Saudi under a leadership that granted free medical care for all expats, regardless of their legal status in this pandemic. 14 million people are benefiting from this royal decree. It's a testimonial for our values that are born from our Islamic religion. Migrants and youth are, uh, which, who are the focus of our task force, they are the most vulnerable with women and youth at the heart of it. Our esteemed contributors and fellow co-chairs for whom I am boundlessly thankful have highlighted following points and I would like to put them as part of the recommendations that we discussed yesterday. To answer your question, yes, of course, there is something that we can, can be done on short term. On long term, it's actually what we have been discussing. And if it's one task force, I can, I dare say that nothing has changed except made things worse for is our task force. These are the most vulnerable. And if you look uh, at migrants, they are, um, they are on the forefront of, uh, of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. There's one in five people who are active in the workforce of high income countries is an immigrant. And uh, they are relied upon in all sectors, healthcare, essential services. And there is need for immediate uh, uh, immigrant workers. And we ha what we have seen is that some countries have already acted because of uh, the need. And what we can see is in Italy, they have paved the way for six months res residence permits. Uh, they were to be issued to, to, to 560,000 unaccounted migrants. And Sweden have already uh, looked into uh, extending work permits for um, migrants. Now I'd like to go into our recommendations and there are uh, seven of them. And we have, I'd like to say that we have re received a, quite a, a good number of uh, policy briefs by uh, uh, wonderful authors that have uh, really uh, created uh, well done peer 
uh, reviewed well uh, authorship. So the first one is fiscal sustainability and social cohesion in the face of demographic change. And here they uh, suggest that by raising productivity through human capital investment, increasing women participation in labor, extending retirement age, um, another point that uh, you, uh, you know, we can focus on is investment in formal and technical education. The third point is fiscal frameworks revision and uh, looking at public spending and taxation reforms. And the fourth point is comprehensive reform of public pension, social security and, and healthcare schemas. Uh, the second uh, recommendation is financial inclusion for the internally displaced. By developing diagnostic processes for understanding uh, host countries' financial architecture and the demographics of the displaced people, using these diagnostics to formulate a strategy that will integrate and identify the best ways for the internally displaced to access these financial instruments. The third recommendation is a G2020 protocol on forced migration. This is a new protocol that will solve the burden sharing problem of forced migration and assures lives in safety and um, dignity. It's a multinational platform that balances the national interests and capabilities of its member states. Number four is refugees and host economies where the adversely affected natives can transition to new jobs. This uh, looks at entrepreneurship among refugees and help local business dynamism. This will uh, so be supported by education and legal and financial support, looking at the youth bulge and migration from south to north. Number five is integration of, migra of migrants as a three-way process and its implications on the future of training and education. In the face of labor shortages and aging demographics, human capital investment at uh, migrant sending countries is more important right now, especially with closing borders and more stringent and uh, uh, you know, rules that are uh, being governed, especially in the face of pandemics. The uh, technical, vocational, education, and training schemes will consider the needs of destination countries while seeking improvement of countries of origin. This will improve the prospects of, uh, uh, prospects of integration for the uh, uh, migrants. Number six is education of migrant youth population from the standpoint of tertiary access to universities or technical training for young adults keeping in mind that only 3% of uh, refugees end up in universities. This is done by increased funding and strengthening community of interest. Number seven is comprehensive virtual consultative services for refugees. By launching a portal for the G20, which offers legal, medical, and educational services, which will facilitate United Nations and other NGOs work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Royal Highness, uh, for the great presentation. Now we'll move to the Task Force Sustainability Energy, Water and Food System, led by Dr. Hassa Mtairi. Dr. Hassa, it seems that two topics that became even, uh, even more prominent with the pandemic are energy market stability and food security. How has this impact the work done by uh, your task force. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Turkey. Good afternoon, Your Royal Highness, Prince Turkey Faisal, Your Excellency, Dr. Fahd Mubarak. Thank you very much for joining us today and for your remarks and support to the T20. Thank you also for the President of CAPSARC, Mr. Adam, and for the T20 Chair, Dr. Fahd Turkey, and for the esteemed panelists. Let me use this opportunity to uh, thank all the lead co-chairs, the co-chairs and the authors of policy briefs for their commitments during this difficult time. I want also to thank everyone working hard behind the scene to make this uh, conference a success. Going back to your question, Turkey, uh, these are very important topics 
for the functioning of the economy and the well-being of populations. We have at least two policy briefs dedicated to these issues. Also, the topics um, are important for the G20. The Saudi G20 presidency has the aim of safeguarding the planet by fostering collective efforts to protect our glo uh, global commons. This aims is particularly aligned with the priorities of the task force, since it includes promoting cleaner and more sustainable energy systems and affordable energy access, promoting water sustainability and reducing food loss and waste. For food security, the recommendations are related to the resilience of supply chains, which have been tested during the pandemic, the importance of free trade in contrast to the food export restriction imposed by some countries during the crisis, and the enhancement of the di dialogue between large fo uh, food producers and consumers. For energy market stability, strong actions have already uh, been taken by the G20 with the virtual extraordinary meeting of the G20 energy ministers in April. The recommendation from the task force emphasize the energy, uh, emphasizes that energy market stability needs to be considered in the broader context of energy transition. Of course, the task force looks at both topics, not only in the context of the current, uh, current crisis, but also from the long term perspective. Um, also, let me tell you more about the, uh, the work that um, had been done by the, by the task force. In total, we have um, uh, 19 policy briefs focusing on different topics that we broadly categorize them in five groups. And I will um, um, give you some of the recommendations under each uh, group. Uh, the 19 policy uh, briefs are, author, are authored by 104 authors representing uh, 57 think tanks, universities, and research centers um, from across the globe. And under the 19 policy briefs, we have 72 recommendations. Many of these recommendations have means of implementation, but I'll just mention a few recommendations under each um, category. So we have policy br uh, briefs dedicated to water, energy, food nexus. And the main recommendations is to create a working group to assess the full cost and benefits of desalination and to promote policies that support safe urban water reuse and water saving technologies in agriculture. Provide public support to increase electricity access in remote rural areas of Asia, Africa and Latin America also to promote smart city, digital technologies, and internet of things. And related to bioeconomy, we have recommendations that uh, a recommendation of, to support partnership for innovative technologies to address emerging challenges in global food, uh, global food system, and to set up a partnership for research cooperation to facilitate mobilization and management of agriculture uh, R&D funds. For energy security and market stability to create a baseline of timely objective data on the production, consumption, and trade of new energy forms and key mineral inputs, reserve institutional mechanism, mechanism that minimize market volatility, leverage the circular carbon economy framework to reduce the uncertainty of energy transitions, and to share best practices for extraction and recovery of critical minerals. And um, energy transitions, also an important topic. And the recommendation is to promote fit for purpose technology solution across oil and gas supply chain to reach near zero flaring targets. This risking hydrogen implementation and enabling at scale deployment in an adaptive, adaptive way. And finally, for sustainable agriculture and water security to ensure that energy, water, and food policies and investments are gender sensitive, to foster agreements between food trading partners aimed at reconciling global food security and environmental sustainability, support research to measure the socioeconomic and environmental impacts of sustainable agriculture as well as to disseminate good practices and to promote transparency for larger scale agriculture projects. And these are the main recommendations for the task force. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, please. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Hassa, for your explaining uh, for all the work that you have been done and uh, for the policy brief. The last uh, task force, number 11, COVID-19 multidisciplinary approaches to complex problems led by Dr. Yasin Arabi. Last but not least, during these times, what role can research play to reduce the risk of future clients? Could you talk to us more about the research being conducted with the new task force and the policy recommendation you have received as a result? Dr. Yasin. Thank you very much, uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, Your Excellencies, and my dear colleagues. Uh, it's been a great journey with uh, my esteemed uh, colleagues in the, in the task force. Uh, our COVID-19 task force featured presentations from 18 authors representing more than 46 contributions from 25 countries. And as you might expect, uh, the COVID-19 had profound uh, impact on many domains of our lives. And therefore, uh, the, uh, our team focused on six uh, uh, different lines of effort. And uh, with a line of thinking, um, try to think out of the box for these complex uh, problems. So uh, first, the health cluster. Um, comes um, as a prominent uh, issue and our contributors highlighted following themes. We really need to reinforce the role of research as part of the pandemic response, um, which uh, with the view to create a global solution to create greater capacity to reduce the risk of future calamity. We are as strong as our weakest global link and it's imperative to reinforce the concept of health being a global public good requiring programs, policies, and services that are truly global. Um, and we need to have a paradigm shift in our thinking that uh, health budgets and finance are investment for the community. They are not cost, they are really investment. Another major, major thing that comes from the health impact is the impact on mental health component uh, of, of, of the crisis mental health issues are often forgotten in policy formation and they should be addressed adequately. Um, it is important in the fight for, in the fight for COVID-19, um, we should support our healthcare professionals around the world who have shown the courage and dedication during the health crisis. COVID-19 affected many other aspects of our lives, affected education and in the education clusters, Contributors characterized the pandemic as the most significant education shutdown or slowdown in the history. And authors focus not only on education loss, but also on other aspects of support that are parts of schools, such as nutrition programs, health services, promotion of social life, ties. It is important to, for us to welcome the theme of build back better to welcome education systems and students recover and recognize the importance of preserving education financing in the reconstruction phase. In the third cluster, climate and transport, um, we discuss whether uh, uh, as we recover from the crisis, what kind of recovery we will get. Uh, author recommendation included additional focus on human development, reinforcing the importance of decarbonization of tourism industry and decarbonization of transport sector. The task force members reminded us all of the importance of renewed commitment to climate change mitigation and the need to push forward on sustainable development goals. In the fourth cluster, the economic issues which are impacted greatly by, by COVID-19 as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic as it continues will continue to amplify the slowdown of global supply chains, especially in essential industries, such as medical supplies, essential goods, and food supplies. And those need to be all addressed adequately. Our critical issues include the need to coordinate momentary um, uh, policy worldwide, and the need to protect small and medium enterprises, and, this, and definitely to focus on the disproportionate socioeconomic impact on migrant and informal workers. In the fifth cluster, our contributors focus on the, top, the topic of multilateralism. 
the global community must find ways to improve the efficacy and credibility of multilateral organization with a greater transparency and accountability mechanisms. In the last uh, domain, the sixth domain, we looked at the topic of social and technological, technological issues as affected by COVID-19. And one prominent thing that came is the focus on vulnerable groups to ensure that they are all protected during the difficult times. Our team also reminded us of the role of cybersecurity as we are relying more and more on technology and the interse intersection with the protection of citizens in the post-COVID world. I would like to extend my thanks to the great team who worked on this um, extensively in the last several weeks and uh, all the authors and, um, and for all the support I received during this process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yassin. I, uh, I think this brings us to a very impactful close and I would like to uh, once again thank you all, the colleague chair, for their participation in today's panel and more importantly, for their effort in leading their task force. I'm confident that all task forces uh, will deliver appropriate uh, policy recommendations that address all priorities that set out. And thank you all for your time and I return to you, Saleh. <laughs>